At the end of 1989, the Sega Genesis was still a real question mark in the eyes of many gamers. The system was well represented on store shelves, with standout titles like Thunder Force 2, Ghouls and Ghosts, and The Revenge of Shinobi. But the TurboGrafx-16 had several hits of its own, including the legendary Axe, R-Type, and a CD-ROM drive. But both systems were being dwarfed by Nintendo, whose recently released games included Mega Man 2, Tecmo Bowl, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The fate of the Genesis may therefore have rested on its performance over the course of the following year, when Sega would continue porting over its arcade hits, welcome multiple third-party publishers to the platform, and ultimately quadruple the size of the system's library. On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, we take an in-depth look at the Sega Genesis in 1990. The 16-bit microprocessor allows for enhanced graphics, more memory capability, stereo sound, depth perception, simulated 3D. You now have a game that is richly enhanced, a game that uh, is very, very similar to that that you would find in the arcade. In 1982, Japanese game developer Orca released Looper, a maze game not unlike Ladybug, and marine-based shooter The Bounty. But like many small arcade developers to crop up in Japan in the early 80s, Orca was bankrupt by 1984. Its ex-employees founded a new company, Crux, that designed Gyrodyne, a helicopter-based shooter published by Taito that saw home ports on both the MSX and Famicom. They also developed Repulse, published by Sega, a fixed shooter that features enemy ships scaling into the playfield from the front or back. By 1985, Crux was also bankrupt, but out of its ashes rose Toa Plan. Initially developing arcade games for Taito, Toa Plan produced a number of shooters that would end up ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System, including Tiger Heli, Twin Cobra, and Sky Shark. Once the 16-bit generation began, several Toa Plan shooters made their way to the Mega Drive and Genesis, including Hellfire, Fire Shark, and the meme famous Zero Wing. But the first Toa Plan game released on Sega's 16 bit platform was also one of the first games released on the Genesis in 1990. Tatsujin was published for the Japanese arcades by Taito and is a vertically scrolling spaceship shooter in which you play the role of space pilot Tom, who as the last hope of the Borgosians, takes control of the Super Fighter in order to turn back the invading Guidance. Tatsujin was brought to Western arcades by both Midway and Romstar under a new name, Truxton. A Toa Plan programmed port was released on the Genesis in January of 1990, and was the first of eight shooters released on the platform that year. Famous for both its difficulty and its status as the pseudo-official game of Classic Game Room, Truxton is a fairly boilerplate vertically scrolling spaceship shooter. Tom's ship can be outfitted by one of three different weapons, chosen between by picking up the appropriate drop, which also changes the color of the ship. The ever-present spread gun is probably the best all-around weapon in the game, 
and is joined by the Thunder Laser, which locks on to larger targets, and the eponymous Truxton Laser, which is really just a big green pulse cannon that concentrates all of its firepower straight ahead. You can also deploy destroyer bombs that both damage everything on the screen and clear it of enemy fire. This was apparently the coolest thing about the game back in 1990, since it was the screenshot that every gaming magazine made sure to print. Truxton was adapted for home displays by cropping off the top of the screen and adding a status bar on the right, a common tactic when bringing many shooters home. Unfortunately, this shrinks the vertical size of the playfield by about 25%, and since sprites were not reduced in size to compensate, the screen can feel crowded, and lightning-fast reflexes are going to be needed if you want to stay alive. At least they tried to kind of maintain the aspect ratio. For the PC Engine port of Tatsujin, they just turned it into a 4-3 game. Truxton has somehow managed to make itself a standout Genesis title without really being an outstanding game. Objectively, Truxton is extraordinarily average. Subjectively, however, there's just something about it and its early Genesis vibe that makes Truxton more than the sum of its parts. Perhaps the biggest advantage that Sega had over its home console rivals was a large catalog of arcade hits from which to draw. While many of these games took a necessary hit when being ported to the Master System, the hardware of the Mega Drive and Genesis was a much more natural fit, as the console's design was based on their own System 16 arcade board. One of the most popular System 16 titles was Golden Axe, released into American arcades in the summer of 1989. Golden Axe was the brainchild of Makoto Uchida, whose other works at Sega include Altered Beast, Alien Storm, You're ghost, dude. and the Dynamite Decca series, the first of which was released in North America's Die Hard Arcade. Inspired by Conan the Barbarian, Uchida wanted to create a game that would combine the atmosphere of that movie with the gameplay of Double Dragon. Featuring three playable characters, Axe Battler is based on the aforementioned Conan, Gilius Thunderhead was modeled after the dwarves of the Lord of the Rings books, and Tyrus Flair was inspired by the paintings of fantasy artist Boris Vallejo, who coincidentally provided the box art for a number of Genesis games, including Golden Axe 2. Whichever character you choose, it's up to you to rescue the King and Princess of Yuria from the evil Death Adder. Nope. That's him. To further differentiate his game from genre predecessors like Renegade and the aforementioned Double Dragon, Uchida armed his three playable characters with weapons, and allowed them to ride captured beasts. Offensive magic is also available, with both its type and strength unique to each character. Golden Axe was the first proper beat-em-up released on the Genesis when it hit store shelves sometime in late January. Although the usual concessions had to be made when bringing the game home, this iteration of Golden Axe is, overall, a very capable home port, and was also just the second non-sports game to feature simultaneous two-player play after 1989's Forgotten Worlds. The graphics are naturally less detailed, although the game still sports some impressively large sprites. The sound effects, while different, still get the job done, and Toru Nakabayashi's soundtrack, even on the Genesis, is still one of my all-time favorites. Lastly, the controls are, dare I say, more responsive than the arcade original. 
New to this home port is a final showdown with new boss Deathbringer. And while this extra stage may have the atmosphere of afterthought, it's still more than welcome additional content. Speaking of additional content, the home version of Golden Axe also features a one-on-one, -on -one, two-player-only fighting mode. While this may not have the depth of, say, Street Fighter 2, I can personally attest to the fact that it gave the game additional replay value after my teenage friends and I had grown tired of beating the game for the hundredth time. Which brings me to my only real criticism. Even with the added level, Golden Axe is not a particularly long or particularly difficult game. It only takes about 30 minutes to play through, and while it may take you a few tries to figure out the best strategy for each boss, before long you'll be beating the game in your sleep. Usually that would severely impact the game's replay value, but thanks to its tight gameplay and awesome atmosphere, Golden Axe remains one of my absolute favorite games on the Sega Genesis. Kotaro Hayashida was hired at Sega in 1983, initially to design games for their SG-1000 home console. By 1986, the Famicom was selling well in Japan, and Hayashida and his co-workers were challenged with making a game that would sell as well on the Sega Mark III as Super Mario Bros. was for Nintendo. Out of this work came Alex Kidd in Miracle World, which while by no means a Mario killer, is one of Sega's more beloved 8-bit titles. The game was released on the Master System in 1987 and would eventually come built into the system's memory as a digital pack-in game. Several Alex Kidd games were released on the Master System, including the outstanding Alex Kidd and Shinobi World, a cartoony send-up of Sega's popular arcade game Shinobi. In late January of 1990, a 16-bit installment in the Alex Kidd series made its way to the Genesis, Alex Kidd and the Enchanted Castle. Plot-wise a direct sequel to the original Master System game, Enchanted Castle certainly maintains the flavor of the original Alex Kidd. A cartoon-like presentation is paired up with solid level design, featuring hidden areas, and an awesome variety between stages. There's really no question that Sega stuck to the formula with this installment in the franchise, but in doing so they made a game that feels like it belongs on the Master System, rather than what was, at the time, next-generation hardware. The game is certainly not bad, and probably would have made for a weekend's worth of fun back in 1990, but on a console being marketed towards older gamers, Enchanted Castle somehow feels out of place. Unsurprisingly, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle would be the lone Genesis appearance of Sega's adolescent Simeon mascot. The year after he designed the original Alex Kidd, Kotaro Hayashida designed the anime tie-in game Zillion. With the main character's gun serving as a tie-in back to the Master System's own light phaser. After Zillion, Hayashida began work directing the first installment of what would become Sega's marquee role-playing franchise, Fantasy Star. Unlike most RPGs of its day, Fantasy Star takes place in a world skewed more towards science fiction than medieval fantasy, charging your party of four with the task of saving not just one planet, but an entire solar system from an iron-fisted King Lassic. Due to its 4 megabit ROM chip, at $70, Fantasy Star was the most expensive game on the Master System, but also represented a benchmark release for both the platform and the genre, giving any role-playing game on the NES a run for its money in terms of content, scope, and presentation. The game employs then-genre mainstays like random turn-based battle encounters and dungeon crawling, but does so from a first-person perspective the latter being a major technological achievement of lead programmer Yuji Naka. 
people often like to point out that the Master System was technologically superior to the NES, and I can think of few better examples than Fantasy Star. As the combination of Naka's programming, Rieko Kodama's artwork, and Tokuhiko Uwabo's soundtrack pushed the hardware to its absolute limit. Fantasy Star was released to rave reviews in all regions, and although the lack of an installed user base in North America limited its popularity here, in Japan, stores had trouble keeping the game in stock, and in Brazil, it was one of the few Master System games to be translated into Portuguese prior to release. It was therefore all but a given that a sequel would be developed, but it wasn't originally intended for the Mega Drive. In the summer of 1988, after significant progress had been made developing Fantasy Star 2 for the Master System, the development team was told that the game was instead to be released on Sega's upcoming 16-bit system. When it was released here in early March of 1990, Fantasy Star 2 was the biggest Genesis game yet at 6 megabits. But producer Yuji Naka had to push to get that upgraded from 4, and even with the extra 2 megabits, there simply wasn't enough room on the cartridge or enough time for the creative team's vision to become a reality. The most noticeable symptoms of this being the omission of the three-dimensional dungeons and the missing backgrounds on the battle screens that were a graphical highlight of the original game. Changes were also made to the game's plot, but it still set a new standard for storytelling in a video game. Fantasy Star 2 takes place in the same solar system as the original, but a thousand years later, and has even more of a futuristic science fiction atmosphere than its predecessor. Written and directed by Akinori Nishiyama, perhaps a reflection of their respective consoles, Fantasy Star 2's plot was much more complex and mature than the original. Delving into such topics as man's over-dependence on the luxuries of modern technology, the unwillingness to question those who provide such technology, and the concept of humans as an invasive species. Due in part to its 6 megabit ROM, Fantasy Star 2 hit stores with an initial MSRP of $79.99 and was released with a pocket-sized 100-page hint book. In Japan, this book was available as a separate purchase, but thanks to Sega of America marketing director Al Nilsson, in order to both give a better value to the consumer and make the game more accessible to genre neophytes, the book was included with the game at no additional charge. Like the original Fantasy Star on the Master System, Fantasy Star 2 was met with critical and consumer acclaim, and is not only one of the best games on the Genesis, but is regularly hailed as one of the greatest games of all time. Even with its hefty price tag, of the 46 games released that year, Fantasy Star 2 might have been the biggest must-buy game of 1990. In the early to mid-1980s, before the proliferation of PC clones, Western computer gaming was primarily done on the Apple II, Commodore 64, and Sinclair ZX Spectrum. In Japan, however, at that time the best computer games were found on NEC's PC-88 line and the MSX. In 1982, Technosoft was founded to develop games for the Japanese home computer, and in 1983 released Thunder Force, a free-roaming shooter the sequel to which was a launch title for the Genesis when it was released in 1989. In 1988, Technosoft released Herzog on both the PC-8801 and the MSX, and the following year developed a sequel for the Mega Drive called Herzog 2. The Herzog games arguably gave birth to the real-time strategy genre, with the first game laying the groundwork for the second. Herzog 2 was localized for and published on the Genesis by Sega in April of 1990, and was no doubt the most unique game on the console up to that point. Whether you play a game against the computer or go two-player head-to-head, after choosing a map, you and your opponent each start off with one primary base, and compete to take over as many of the neutral remote bases as possible, with the ultimate goal being to destroy the other player's primary camp. 
to that end, you control a robot that can shapeshift between three different forms. The attack jet can move around the map faster and attack other airborne units. The infantry soldier can attack other ground-based enemies and uses far less energy. And the air transport can move your units around the map. What makes Herzog Zwei unique among real-time strategy games is that, rather than playing as the hand of God or a general pulling levers from behind the scenes, in this game your boots are on the ground. Through your mech, you buy units, issue them orders, and then deploy them in the field by physically carrying them there, as well as getting into firefights yourself. The game requires you to think strategically but quickly, but you also need the fast reflexes normally called for by an arcade game. Anyone who spent time with Technosoft's earlier Genesis release, Thunder Force 2, will instantly recognize many of Herzog Zwei's sound effects, and the two games share a similar atmosphere. This may have been a source of confusion back in the day, as nothing about the game's packaging gives much of a hint about just what kind of game it is, and many may have expected something more in line with Thunder Force 2. I often hear it said that Herzog Spy received poor reviews, when it really only got one, in which the EGM review crew mostly complained that it was too complicated. While GamePro avoided reviewing the game altogether, game players named it their June Game of the Month, while video games and computer entertainment heralded Herzog Spy as a computer quality strategy game on a home console. After Herzog Spy, it would be four months before the Genesis would get another first-party release. But this gap was filled by the arrival of the first third-party publishers on the platform, beginning with Seismic, probably best known as the Western publisher of Musha, who released two games on the Genesis in mid-April of 1990. The first, Super Hydlide, is the 16-bit follow-up to Hydlide, an action role-playing game developed by TNE Soft for a variety of Japanese home computers that itself got an awful NES port. Super Hydlide's audiovisuals are nothing to write home about, but the open-world design and deep gameplay have made it well-regarded among classic RPG fans. Seismic also released Air Diver, a combat flight simulator developed specifically for the Mega Drive and Genesis. The gameplay is fairly shallow, but Air Diver has decently detailed graphics and great music. A month later, the second third-party publisher to throw their hat in the ring was DreamWorks, when they released action puzzler Shove It! The Warehouse game in mid-May. While it may not have fit in with the motif of the Genesis library at the time, it was and is a charming game that would have made for a decent weekend rental if the A-list games were already taken. It would be another month and a half before a new Genesis game hit store shelves, but this time it would be from the biggest third-party publisher to partner with Sega. Already well-established in the field of computer software, by the late 80s, Electronic Arts was looking to expand into the home console market. Founder Trip Hawkins was impressed by the Sega Genesis, but not accustomed to the idea of paying licensing fees simply to release software, Electronic Arts reverse-engineered the console, defeating Sega's protection scheme. Hawkins used this as leverage to negotiate a very favorable business deal with Sega, in which EA would pay just $2 per unit instead of the usual 10 but would manufacture the games themselves, resulting in cartridges that looked markedly different than those produced by Sega. Although at the time, Sega may have felt as though they'd been steamrolled by Hawkins and EA, this arrangement undeniably contributed more to the overall success of the console than any other third-party partnership. In early July, both Budokan, the Martial Spirit, and Populous were released on the Genesis by EA. Budokan is an interesting entry in the pre-Street Fighter II one-on-one fighting genre that actually has you training in various techniques before entering a martial arts tournament. Unfortunately, the game's vision outshines its gameplay, and what's left is a game that might look enticing at first, but is, ultimately, a disappointing gameplay experience. Populous is a title best known for launching the god game genre, when it was released on the Amiga in 1989, 
and is considered one of the best computer games of all time. Although the Genesis is certainly not the ideal platform on which to play it, it did bring the game to those for whom a home computer was simply out of reach. That same month also saw a second DreamWorks release, Target Earth. A Western localization of Assault Suit Lanos, the first game in the Assault Suit series by NCS, Target Earth is a side-scrolling mech-based action game whose brutal difficulty may cause some to shy away, but that provides a fulfilling experience to those willing to tough it out. In early August, an avalanche of new first-party Genesis games are released, with Sega once again dipping into their extensive catalog of arcade hits. The original Monaco GP was released by Sega all the way back in 1979. The game uses an overhead point of view on a vertically scrolling playfield and is an impressive looking title for a late 70s release. The game displays player information on a separate LED panel instead of on the CRT screen, and has the distinction of being the last major arcade release to be based around Transistor Transistor Logic, or TTL, instead of a CPU. In 1983, the game was ported to Sega's first entry in the home console market, the SG-1000, and was an impressive home translation. For the next several years, the Monaco GP series went dark, but in 1989, a new game was released on Sega's X-Board system, the third in their line of Super Scalar arcade hardware, whose specialty was pseudo-3D graphics via sprite scaling. Super Monaco GP takes advantage of this hardware by shifting from an overhead to first-person point of view. The game features a single track that, sort of but not really, resembles the Circuit de Monaco in Monte Carlo. Once the race begins, the game sets position limits that you have to stay in front of in order to continue. If you're able to complete the race, you simply race on the same track a second time, but in the wet. Super Monaco GP was subsequently ported to just about every home gaming platform of the day, but it was Sega's own 16-bit hardware that got by far the best release, when the Genesis version of Super Monaco GP arrived in-store sometime in early August. While this home version may lack the visual pizzazz of the arcade original, it's more than made up for with the addition of content that turns Super Monaco GP from a simple arcade title into a driving game that the home gamer could really sink their teeth into. The original arcade mode is here, but the game also offers a career mode called World Championship that contains every real-world track used in the 1989 Formula One season. You start off driving for a lower-level constructor, but can move up to better teams by choosing and then beating rival drivers. All team names and driver names are technically fictitious, but it's usually not too difficult to figure out who they're referring to. As stated, the game is expectedly inferior to the arcade original in the audiovisual department, thanks to the lack of scaling trackside sprites, but the backgrounds are all specific to each track, and the music is quite catchy. The controls do take some getting used to, as it can be difficult at first not to accidentally downshift while turning. Much like 1989's Super Hang-On, Super Monaco GP takes a relatively simplistic arcade game and fleshes it out, making it a far better game for a home audience. Assuming at least a passing interest in racing games, Super Monaco GP would have been a no-brainer purchase in August of 1990. Other first-party August releases include Yu Suzuki's Afterburner 2, a home port of the wildly successful arcade game that ran on the same hardware as Super Monaco GP. Once again, a super scalar game made for a capable home translation, but in order to accommodate the limited number of buttons on the Genesis controller, your machine gun is constantly firing, which is kind of annoying. More importantly, unlike Super Monaco GP, nothing was done to add any extra content to this game making Afterburner 2 a clear weekend rental. Columns, a game more closely associated with the Game Gear, actually got its start on home computer systems, 
having been designed by a Hewlett Packard employee named Jay Geertsen before being purchased by Sega, who initially released it on their lesser known System C arcade board. The game was ported to the Genesis and became Sega's flagship entry in the tile-matching genre popularized by Tetris, becoming the original pack-in game for the Game Gear when it was released in 1991. Columns is a solid puzzle game that itself has been imitated many times, but is a game that, growing up, I could never see as anything but a Tetris clone. To better take advantage of this bevy of home arcade ports, also hitting stores in August of 1990 was the Sega Arcade Power Stick. Very much the Genesis analog to Nintendo's Advantage joystick, the Power Stick features a ball-top arcade-style joystick and three large action buttons with independently adjustable turbo function. And just as the Genesis controller is itself more ergonomic than the competition, so too is the Power Stick. As is the case with Nintendo's offering, Sega's stick uses rubber domes instead of proper micro-switches, and therefore lacks the feeling of the genuine article, but it was yet another attempt by Sega to bring the arcade into the living room. Another August release was a Sega-programmed port of Cyberball, a moderately successful four-player Atari arcade game. The Mega Drive port of this futuristic 7-on-7 seven -seven robot-based football-style game supported the Mega Modem for online play. Unfortunately, its North American equivalent, the Telegenesis, was cancelled before Cyberball was released here. What's left is still a reasonably fun pseudo-sports title, reminiscent of games like Base Wars or 2020 Super Baseball. Ready, set, hunt. But hardcore football fans would have been better served by renting this one and keeping most of their cash in their wallets for a few short months. The first of two summer Hollywood tie-in games, Ghostbusters was developed exclusively for the Mega Drive and Genesis through a collaboration between Sega and Compile. An action platform game taking place in the Ghostbusters universe but unrelated to previous games using the Ghostbusters license, you can choose to play as Peter, Ray, or Egon, but not as Winston for whatever reason. Going out on calls to naturally bust ghosts, the game is a lot of fun, and for some reason is one that you don't hear talked about very often. The last Genesis release in the summer of 1990 was Michael Jackson's Moonwalker one of two games developed by Sega as a tie-in to the 1988 movie of the same name, the other being a System 18 arcade release. While the arcade game is an isometric beat-em-up, the home version is a side-scrolling action game. In both cases, your objective is to save children kidnapped by Mr. Big. Michael. And both game soundtracks feature 16-bit versions of many of Jackson's hits. Subsequent events aside, Michael Jackson was one of the biggest stars of the 1980s, and I'm surprised that it took as long as it did for a video game to bear his name. As summer became fall, the Christmas shopping season was fast approaching, and the frequency of Genesis releases increased exponentially. In early October, Tengen released a home port of the Atari arcade game Klax. Seemingly ubiquitous in the early 90s, Klax holds the distinction of being the last official release on the Atari 2600. A unique take on the falling object puzzle genre, Klax features brightly colored tiles moving down a conveyor belt. You catch the tiles as they fall, and then stack them so as to create rows of three or more. 
Klax has a wonderful audiovisual presentation, and I wish it were somehow possible to build a real-life version of the machine featured in the game. A month later, Namco released their first Genesis game, a home port of their System 2 arcade release, Burning Force. Combining the gameplay of a rail shooter like Space Harrier with elements of more traditional shooters, Burning Force is a neat game with a wonderfully vibrant color palette and a great soundtrack. Meanwhile, between mid-October and mid-November, a total of six shooters were published on the Genesis. Renovation released their first game, the Mega Drive and Genesis exclusive Whip Rush by Vic Tokai. A solid game that seems to have been forgotten by the sands of time, Whip Rush is a horizontally and vertically scrolling shooter that features little Gradius-style options and also features an R-Type-esque need for level memorization. You can also adjust the speed of your ship or just have it adjusted for you when you go underwater. Fire Shark was another Toa Plan shooter, this time released by DreamWorks. Rather than taking place in space, Fire Shark has you flying a biplane, whose pilot has traveled into the future to secure more advanced weaponry, allowing him to stave off a massive army trying to take over the world in a 20th century alternate reality. Fire Shark is one of the Genesis games that I like to revisit from time to time, but once you get your plane fully powered up, the game can get a bit boring. Namco released a port of their System 2 mythologically themed shooter Felios, which conjures up images of Clash of the Titans. You take control of Apollo riding Pegasus, the mythical winged stallion, in an effort to rescue Artemis from the snake-footed Typhon. Ooh, I just let him have her. Though the plot is obviously quite different, the fantasy themes of this game remind me of Dragon Spirit on the TurboGrafx-16, in terms of both gameplay and atmosphere. Sage's Creation released their first Genesis title, In Sector X. A horizontally scrolling shooter from Taito that, outside of its entomologically themed motif, is fairly uninteresting. At times, the color palette can look drab. Your character has an annoyingly large hitbox, and overall, the gameplay fails to leave much of an impression. It's far from terrible, but among an embarrassment of shooter riches in the fall of 1990, Insector X was entirely skippable. Seismic released a third Toa Plan port, the horizontally and vertically scrolling Hellfire. A slower-paced shooter like Zero Wing, Hellfire's hook is that it has you switching weapon configurations on the fly in order to necessarily attack in different directions. Ironic as I would place it at the top of the stack, Hellfire might be the Genesis Toa Plan shooter that you hear mentioned the least. Though Mega Magazine in 1992 named it the fourth best game released on the system up to that point. But the biggest shooter release of 1990 was also the first Genesis game to be the sequel to another Genesis game, when Technosoft's Thunder Force 3 hit store shelves in the first week of November. While the original Thunder Force was comprised entirely of overhead levels, Thunder Force 2 was a 50-50 mix. Thunder Force 3, on the other hand, removes these levels altogether and is strictly a side-scrolling affair. Also new to the mix is the ability to choose the order in which you play through the game, which certainly gives it more replay value. Thunder Force 3 is ridiculously difficult, requiring a massive amount of practice and level memorization, but in a way that only makes you want to keep playing it. It probably doesn't hurt that the graphics are some of the most gorgeous yet seen on the Genesis, with a soundtrack to match.
The game has wonderful variety between its excellently designed stages, and one of the best parts about the fact that you can choose your own level progression is that you can see each and every stage regardless of your skill level. As is the case with most shooters, you can pick up various weapons. But like Hellfire, Thunder Force 3 gives you the option of switching between them in real time, which you'll need to learn to do on a situational basis. You can also adjust the speed of your ship, though this is something that I generally set once and then forget about. Thunder Force 3 was the first game in the series developed specifically for the Mega Drive, and was also the first released in the arcades. As in a reversal of the usual flow, the home version was adapted into Thunder Force AC for Sega's aforementioned System C arcade board. Although it may have been the seventh shooter released on the Genesis that year, in terms of fit and finish, Thunder Force 3 really stood head and shoulders above the competition. While even the beloved Truxton could, in my opinion, be relegated to weekend rental status, Thunder Force 3 was clearly 1990's must-buy shooter. Unbelievably, the first Genesis sports game of 1990 wasn't released until the middle of autumn. Super Real Basketball was released in Japan in the spring of 1990, but became another one of Sega's celebrity licensed titles when it was announced for Western release as Pat Riley's Slammin' and Jammin' Basketball. The Slammin' and Jammin' was dropped when the game came out in November, but while not awful, graphics aside, it didn't give sports gamers much reason to put down Double Dribble. But the next sports game released on the system was also one of the biggest hits of 1990 and started one of the most storied franchises of all time. Trip Hawkins had been fascinated by the idea of creating a computer game based on football even before founding Electronic Arts. While a student at Harvard, in 1973 he created a football simulator based on the pencil and paper Stratomatic football on a PDP-11 minicomputer. Ten years later, Electronic Arts was born, and Hawkins still wanted to bring video football to the masses. Unable to secure deals with his first two choices to endorse the yet-unfinished game, Joe Montana and Cal coach Joe Cap, Hawkins fortuitously approached retired Oakland Raiders coach and CBS broadcaster John Madden, and in doing so got more than just an endorser, as Madden would take an active role in ensuring that a game with his name on it accurately represented its real-life equivalent. A major sticking point and the reason that it took four years for the game to finally be released on the Apple II was that Madden insisted on a full 11 players per side, a big ask for primitive computer hardware. As a result, the game ran poorly, but the sheer detail, along with a vast and editable playbook, made for a more than impressive release on the Apple II. In 1989, the newly formed Park Place Productions, as their first release, developed ABC Monday Night Football for the home computer. Monday Night Football. The game lacked any other licensing and had no playbook to speak of, but did feature the full 22 players on the field. The game was popular in the EA office, and Hawkins approached Park Place about coding a Genesis version of John Madden Football. First down, 25 to go. The game was coded by rookie programmer Jim Simmons and was released on the Genesis in early November. Outside of the man himself, John Madden football is totally unlicensed, though like many sports games of its day, cities and associated color schemes were used to give the illusion of legitimacy. Sixteen pseudo-NFL teams are available, plus an all-Madden team, which no doubt is silver and black as an homage to Madden's Oakland roots. As was fairly common at the time, it's not possible to play a complete season but a playoff mode is included, complete with password-based game saves. While perhaps not an audiovisual tour de force, John Madden football looked and sounded next-gen when compared to its contemporaries on the NES. The top-down oblique perspective gave the field depth and the illusion of 3D. The players are well detailed, and the game clock even looks like it's on a real scoreboard. Normal for a sports title, music is mostly non-existent, but the sound effects further add to the sense of realism. 22, hut. The game also has variable weather, which I had certainly never seen before in a sports game, 
and it's pretty fun to play football in the snow. The real genius of John Madden football is that it gives the illusion of being a simulation-style football game while still having the approachability and playability of an arcade game. It's easy to see that Park Place took what they had done with Monday Night Football and expanded on it, bringing in the now signature playbook featured in the Apple II game. With Michael Katz signing him to an endorsement deal earlier in the year, Joe Montana football was originally scheduled for release in time for the holidays, but due to development delays, didn't make it out until early 1991. While that game did spawn its own shorter-lived series on the Genesis, Master System, and Game Gear, it was John Madden football's release in November of 1990 that would kick off the most successful football franchise of all time. The second sports game developed for the Genesis by Electronic Arts was also the second basketball game released on the system. Lakers vs. Celtics in the NBA playoffs is a fully licensed, although not fully featured game, with just eight of the 27 NBA teams in the league at the time, plus East and West All-Star teams. While the branding was shown very briefly in John Madden football, Lakers vs. Celtics marked the true debut of the Electronic Arts Sports Network, or EASN. While this was intended to give their games a greater air of realism, with a presentation very reminiscent of SportsCenter and an initialization to match, it might come as no surprise that ESPN would sue Electronic Arts for trademark infringement, although not until 1992, with an out-of-court settlement causing the creation of the now-famous EA Sports. It's in the game. Lakers vs. Celtics has a level of detail that had not yet been seen in a basketball game. Recognizable players, hardwood courts, a head coach pacing on the sidelines, and real working shot clocks made the game an impressive feat, but were balanced out by sparse sound effects and music that was grating on the ears. More importantly, the gameplay was subpar. So while the fact that you could play through an entire playoff tournament was cool, I'm not sure why you'd want to. Lakers vs. Celtics foreshadowed better things to come from EA in terms of basketball, but at the end of 1990, the discriminating sports gamer was probably still playing double dribble on the NES. Other November releases include EA's Zany Golf, a port of an excellent miniature golf game developed by Sandcastle Productions and originally released on the Apple II GS. Meanwhile, Renovation released their second game, Final Zone, a third-person isometric mecha shooter that was originally developed for the Sharp X68000 home computer by Wolf Team a subsidiary of Telenet Japan, who developed a number of games released in the West under the renovation label. Kaneko released their only Genesis game of the year, DJ Boy, which is sort of a cross between Double Dragon and the Ice Capades. Another handful of pre-Christmas releases from Sega began with eSWAT City Under Siege. A side-scrolling action game based on, but not a port of, their own System 16 arcade release, Cyber Police eSWAT. Another solid first-party title that you don't hear much about, the game very much reminds me of The Revenge of Shinobi, although obviously with a completely different theme. A second Yu Suzuki game was released in November, although this time one custom developed for the Mega Drive in Genesis, Sword of Vermilion an action RPG that looked great on paper in more ways than one, Sega's print ads made the game seem like a must-buy, as did the soundtrack composed by Hiroshi Kawaguchi of OutRun fame. In practice, the game was a bit of a letdown for those who bought it, 
but in the early days of the Genesis, it was slim pickings if you were an RPG fan. But Sega's next two releases, coming out at the very end of November, were clearly intended to push Christmas sales of Genesis hardware. If that's his face, watch this. Before they got more creative with things like the Sega Scream, Celebrity endorsements aside, Sega's Genesis marketing was largely a numbers game. With a 16-bit processor, they could tout that Sega does what Nintendo don't. Well, in the late fall of 1990, Sega had a new number to talk about, 8. That's the size in megabits of what was, according to Sega, the largest game ever released on a home console up to that point. Well, outside of Japan, maybe. Like Ghouls and Ghosts before it, Strider is a Capcom CPS title that was simply licensed by Sega, who then programmed the home version internally. This side-scrolling action game has you playing the role of Strider Hiryu, a futuristic energy sword-wielding ninja, whose task it is to assassinate the Grand Master, who has naturally taken over the world. Primarily taking place in various parts of the old Soviet Union, the dystopian atmosphere of Strider is a real standout feature of the game, as are the audiovisuals in general. The sprites are large and detailed, and the music is outstanding, although the sound effects not so much. What's not a standout feature, at least in my opinion, is the gameplay, which is hampered by clumsy controls, dodgy hit detection, and cheap deaths. Especially considering the game's elevated price tag at the time of its release, due to the larger ROM size, Strider is a game that simply doesn't live up to the hype. But whether you're a fan of the game or not, there's no denying that Sega did an excellent job bringing Strider home with minimal compromise. And much as Ghouls and Ghosts had the previous year, Strider would be held up as a shining example of Sega's ability to bring the arcade experience home. Here's Mickey Mouse, and if you take a look, he really looks exactly like himself. We haven't gone and sacrificed any of the detail on the character at all. Is this new this year? This is brand new. It just started shipping within the last couple of weeks. Another big first-party holiday release clearly intended to put Genesis consoles under the Christmas tree was Castle of Illusion starring Mickey Mouse. While the game may have been intended for younger audiences, thanks to its solid gameplay, impressive presentation, and reasonably challenging difficulty level, Castle of Illusion was and still is a great game for all ages. Castle of Illusion reviewed well at the time of its release and was a standout game for the Genesis. It plays like a pixelated interactive version of the classic Disney cartoons, which, even if you were an older gamer, you no doubt had fond memories of. For some reason, Castle of Illusion sticks out from the Genesis library in a way that the other Disney titles somehow don't. Not to say that any of them are bad games, except for maybe Fantasia, Castle of Illusion just seemed to come along at the right time for the Genesis, and no doubt found itself under many a Christmas tree in 1990. In early December, another publisher kind of joined Sega's lineup when Accolade released the first of several unlicensed games on the Genesis. Rather than trying to work out a more favorable licensing deal with Sega of America, as Electronic Arts had, Engineers at Accolade simply bought a Genesis console, along with a handful of games, and figured out how to disable the system's security lockout. This set off a chain of events that led to a lengthy court battle that could easily be the subject of its own video. But in 1990, all that it meant was that Accolade could release Ishido, Way of the Stones, a board-based puzzle game that has largely been forgotten on the Genesis due to the fact that it's only compatible with early Model 1 consoles that lack Sega's trademark security system. Other pre-Christmas December releases include Sega's own Buster Douglas Boxing, 
a mediocre game best known as Sega's first busted celebrity signing, as by the time the game was released, Douglas, who had signed on the back of his shocking victory over Mike Tyson, had already lost the heavyweight title to Evander Holyfield. Sage's creation released Shadow Blasters, an unremarkable side-scrolling action game. While Razorsoft brought out their first Genesis title, Technocop, primarily remarkable due to its over-the-top blood and gore. Technocop. Technocop is the kind of game that you hoped your parents would just buy without asking too many questions, or reading the back of the box, which clearly said not suggested for children under 12. The game has you playing the role of a cop, driving Road Blaster style in a futuristic Ferrari between crime scenes, where you could either arrest criminals or just shoot them and watch as they collapse into an amorphous pool of blood and entrails. This is, unfortunately, the defining feature of a game that is otherwise largely forgettable. Another electronic arts game to hit the market was Battle Squadron, a well-regarded Amiga shooter originally designed by Enterprise Software. The eighth and final traditional shooter released on the Genesis in 1990, Battle Squadron has some interesting options that you don't normally see as adjustable parameters, including enemy bullet speed and maximum number of enemy bullets on the screen. The game's not bad, but has one of my biggest genre pet peeves, in that it takes about 19 shots to kill anything on the screen. Tengen released a port of the hit Atari arcade game Hard Drivin', which it turns out may have been a bit much for the Genesis hardware. Hard Drivin' was an awesome arcade game, albeit one that cost about a dollar to play, but gave a then-realistic approximation of driving a car to those of us too young for the real thing. Unfortunately, neither the relatively smooth gameplay nor the signature arcade cabinet could be preserved bringing the game home. Well preserved, however, are the creepy death replays, reminiscent of high school driving safety videos intended to shock you into compliance. As an interesting aside, Hard Driven was ported to the Genesis by Sterling Silver Software, who would go on to develop the outstanding PGA Tour Golf series published on the Genesis by EA. Released exclusively in North America was Trampoline Terror by DreamWorks, a game that certainly seems charming, but whose intended source of fun eludes me. And Sega themselves ported arcade shooting gallery game Dynamite Duke, who might take the crown for the worst box art of 1990. Originally developed by Saibu Kaihatsu, perhaps best known for the Raiden series, Dynamite Duke probably would have made for a good light gun game, but isn't one even in the arcade. The final three Genesis games managed to sneak their way into stores in the week between Christmas and New Year's. Electronic Arts released Sword of Sodan, another Enterprise software game, and therefore another Amiga port. A side-scrolling hack-and-slash, or maybe poke-and-slash, Sword of Sodan has awesome graphics, but absolutely horrific gameplay, and might just be the worst game released on the Genesis up to that point. Decidedly not one of the worst Genesis games is Granada, Renovation's third release of 1990. Another Wolf Team game, this time originally released on the Sharp X68000, Granada is sort of a free-roaming shooter that I can best describe as a cross between Thunder Force 2 and Gauntlet. The game takes place in the distant future, 2016 which I suppose in 1990 felt like a lifetime away. You drive your hypertech cannon tank around a huge map, destroying a number of predetermined targets, be they enemy generators or large gun emplacements, in order to trigger the boss battle, bring the level to an end. Although it seems like a common sense control mechanic, Granada has a much welcome strafe button, making the game arguably more playable than many other shooters of its ilk. The graphics are impressive, but not as much as its soundtrack. The 
music was written by prolific composer Motoi Sakuraba, who has almost 180 game credits to his name, including the recently released Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom on the Nintendo Switch. Although Granada may not be on the average gamer's radar when it comes to the Genesis library, it certainly has a deserved reputation among the hardcore, and at least in my opinion was and still is one of the must-play games for the Genesis. Finally, Sega released their own Genesis game that was itself a sequel to a previous Genesis game. Just as The Revenge of Shinobi had been the last game released on the Genesis in 1989, Shadow Dancer, The Secret of Shinobi, was among the last games released on the system in 1990. The original Shadow Dancer was released on Sega's System 18 the previous year. The game is considered a part of the Shinobi series, but unlike The Revenge of Shinobi, does not continue the plot from the 1987 original. Instead, you take control of a young ninja trying to protect an orbiting space station from the terrorist group Asian Dawn. Wait, Asian Dawn? I read about them in Time magazine. Oh, all right. The gameplay is quite similar to the original Shinobi, but with the addition of a canine companion that can attack enemies while you hide behind cover. Shadow Dancer is a great arcade game that saw home ports on the Amiga, as well as the Master System in Europe and Brazil. But for the Mega Drive and Genesis, a new game was created that carried over the name, the dog, and not much else. Unlike the arcade game, The Secret of Shinobi, which really should have been the game's standalone title, does continue the storyline from the previous game. Following the events of The Revenge of Shinobi, after a brief retirement, Joe Musashi is back at it. This time trying to save New York City from the evil terrorist group Union Lizard. The gameplay itself is, for me, not quite as on point as The Revenge of Shinobi, but is still more than respectable. The game also brings back bonus stages, which were a part of the original Shinobi, but were left out of The Revenge. The dog mechanic introduces a whole new dimension to the gameplay, though I find I don't use it as often as one might think. I could really do without the one-hit kills, which definitely lead to some cheap deaths and Shadow Dancer seems to rely less on fast reflexes and more on level memorization through trial and error. The game is, however, very generous with extra lives, so I think frequent death just has to be taken as par for the course when mastering the game. While not composed by Yuzo Koshiro as The Revenge of Shinobi had been, Shadow Dancer's music is still quite good. As is probably the case with most games, the graphics in Shadow Dancer can be hit or miss depending on the level, but as a whole are a marked improvement over the previous installment. Shadow Dancer is a praiseworthy title, and like a few other 1990 releases, has a certain polish to it that many earlier Genesis games lacked, and certainly would have made for an excellent addition to one's Genesis library. As the year came to a close, Sega had 62 games on the shelf for the Genesis, many of which are still considered all-time classics on the system. The TurboGrafx-16 may have provided a worthy adversary in the early days of the 16-bit generation, but in the coming months a new challenger awaited, a 16-bit console from Nintendo that was going to give Sega of America the fight of their lives. But that's all a story for another day. That's going to do it for this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.